Welcome to the second day of Carter School Peace Week. Um, this is a week, obviously, to um, basically celebrate and basically um, contribute to the advancement of knowledge and practice by people both in our school and, and in the peace building community generally. Uh, our session today, as you know, is Civilian Peacemakers, uh, Preserving Peace in Post-Violent Societies. But let me emphasize that civilian peacemakers obviously have contributed to, um, to uh, the work of during cases of extreme violence. Um, there are so many cases in which civilians have been the catalyst for uh, reducing violence for positive change. I'm just reminded of the case in Argentina, uh, Northern Ireland, Sierra Leone, and just last year we have a political revolution in Sudan, where, which was led by um, which was led by uh, women, who, uh, who civilians who led the revolution, and that's a now undergoing a three-year transition period. So today we have um, the other panelists are outstanding contributors to this theme. And it's just such a pleasure to see and again be on the panel with, with uh, my colleagues and, and also a, a, uh, a, as it were, former colleague, Bridget Moy, um, who we're going to start with, Bridget, I'd like to ask you to go first. Uh, Bridget Moy is U.S. Executive Director of Peace Direct, which is a um, very reputable uh, uh, an agency that promotes civilian peace builders. Bridget has worked for 20 years in international peace and conflict issues with a focus on U.S. foreign policy. Um, our second speaker uh, is Karina Coristolina. Um, oh, and I should mention, by the way, Bridget is no stranger to our school, having uh, received a PhD from um, what used to be called the um, School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Now we're the Carter School. Uh, our second speaker, Karina Coristolina, is professor and director of the program uh, co-director of Program for Prevention of Mass Violence and director of the Program on History, Memory, and Conflict. Karina's work, I think, is well known to many people in, in our school and, and elsewhere on a wide range of critical topics, and her books could fill small libraries, maybe wow. mid-sized libraries, I would say. Um, and if you printed the articles out, it would be full libraries. Um, so. Karina, I'd like to ask you to go second. Our third speaker, Arthur Romano, is Assistant Professor of Conflict Analysis and Resolution at the Carter School, currently enjoying a two-year um, uh, commitment in the Korea campus right now. And um, so you win the prize of coming from the farthest away, which may not be difficult, but the time frame is quite different. Arthur is has been doing groundbreaking work on grassroots peace building. Excuse me. I'd like to ask everybody to turn off their mic, to mute your mic. Um, Arthur is a scholar practitioner whose research, whose research and applied interests include global education movements, the use of transformative and experiential education in communities affected by violence and non-violent violent education. Um, while we're waiting, let me just introduce also Mark Gopin. Obviously, everybody at um, our school should know and read so much, uh, all, all of Mar Mark's works, everybody, anybody who is engaged and studies religious peace building should also should have known and probably has read and should read continue to read Mark's work. Mark is the James H. Lowry Professor of World Religions, Diplomacy, 
and conflict resolution. Um, and it's, uh, Mark is kind of like my, my second, you know, my, he always anticipates what I'm gonna think and say. So we do a number of topics together, as you'll see in this uh, panel. Um, and then I will um, conclude the session, the presentations with <coughs> my talk on a laboratory for peace. So I will begin with um, Bridget Moyes. Actually, let me see, Daniel. <clears throat> It'll be easier. Let me see if I can share my screen because I think I can. Okay. You can know. You can know. Yes. Okay. So um, uh, I'll share my screen in just a second. Um, thank you so much. First of all, I just want to say thank you for the invitation to be part of this conversation. And of course, congratulations to formerly SCAR, now the Carter School and Peace Week and all the activities that are underway. It's really great to, to see the school flourishing and to be part of this. So thanks um, everyone. I think what I'll do is try to set the stage. Um, you're gonna have a lot more in-depth um, knowledge and, and experience and case studies coming from, from the speakers that follow. So what I'd like to do is set the stage about um, sort of the work that we do here at Peace Direct around supporting local peace builders and locally led peace building and and why we do that and why we think it's important and some of the trends that we're seeing uh, in civilian led peace building so let me try to share this and i'll just show a few slides can can people see my my screen now and are you looking at some beautiful faces of peace builders so um you may see some of my other screen but let's just um uh, look at this so peace direct who are we we are an international organization that works with local people to stop violent conflict and build lasting peace. And the organization was founded in London. It's been around um, since about 2004 there, and we now have a US office that's been up and running for about five years now. And um, we, since the beginning, have been really dedicated to finding and supporting local people who are on the front lines of violent conflict because we believe those who are most impacted by violence and conflict understand the problems best, know their communities best, and have the solutions they need. So our job is to help um, leverage our relationships and our power and our abilities um, where we are to partner with them. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. These are some of our partners from DRC and Sri Lanka and other places um, and dear, dear friends as well. So just to give you a, a snapshot um, of where we work, um, we work with partners in about 16 countries now, uh, and including the United States, we're starting programming here, which I'll, I'll mention as well. And in all of these places, we really try to both identify long-term strategic partners. So who are those local peace builders who really understand the communities, are respected by the communities, uh, are doing amazing work, but maybe are not yet able to access much funding, maybe are not yet able to access the international um, community uh, very well. And how do we find and, um, and partner with them in ways that, that they want um, and that support the work that they do. And um, we have been heavily concentrated in Africa, you'll see, but also some Asia um, and Middle East uh, work as well has been developing and will be expanding partnerships into Latin America, we hope um, soon as well. So how do we work? Well, as I said, um, we have essentially three methods that we use. We use direct partnerships and that's um, with individual organizations, but increasingly also with networks because we really understand that supporting um, the ecosystem of local peace building, the ecosystem of civil society is critical for sustainable peace building. So we've been doing a lot more transitioning to thinking about how can we be a partner for um, supporting networks and, and, um, and networking among local peace building groups in different countries. Um, we also do engage in participatory research with partners, so really trying to understand what is the information, evidence, um, knowledge that they need, that they don't have, that they want, um, that we could help with. 
and um, how do we uh, engage in that in sort of a participatory action research uh, approach, which actually links to our third way of working, which is with collaborative um, advocacy. So we have public education and also advocacy, um, which our research feeds into. So we're really looking at um, both the work in communities and how do we strengthen that, the work of understanding um, how do we understand peace building and support what needs to be done better, and the work of really changing systems of power <clears throat> and of participation. That's systems of power in terms of advocacy and policy and also in terms of um, building a movement of a public who understands what peace building is. A lot of times we're speaking in our own echo chamber. So Peace Direct's very much trying to get out of that echo ch chamber. Uh, over the course of our lifetime as an organization, we've also developed a website some of you may know called Peace Insight. So if you go to peaceinsight.org, you can see that. And it's, it's really trying to bust the myth when you hear people say that in a conflict context, there's just no capacity. Um, there's nothing, you know, external actors need to come in and intervene and bring all our knowledge and all our skills because the local people, they're caught up in a cycle of conflict and they're just, um, you know, they're unable to, to find solutions for peace. Well, we actually don't think that's true. And we have a lot of evidence, um, Peace Insight has mapped over, it's actually over 1800 uh, organizations now who are viable, active organizations in communities doing very important work um, for peace building. And so we really wanna bust the myth that, um, that external actors uh, have the solutions because we don't think that's true. We certainly think external actors have roles to play, important ones, um, but we know and our experience has been over 16 years now that um, there are always people building peace. There are always local groups, local leaders um, taking risks, doing amazing work, and they're often overlooked. They're often underfunded. They're often um, unable to participate in formal peace processes. Um, their voices and their work is seen as marginal, uh, sometimes naive, and, um, and sometimes um, simply just not even included in, in the picture when we're talking about um, peace building from an external academic um, or policy oriented perspective. So, our aim is really to change that because I, I just want to tell you that the people that we work with um, are incredible. And um, just to give you a few examples, um, uh, if you can read this tiny text, I'm sorry it's so small, um, you know, from the past year, from 2019 actually, we have worked with over 70 organizations just in that year, uh, in 11 countries in that year. And we have examples here of Mali of some specific um, work that they've done, you know, over a thousand people benefiting from organizations in the in youth-led organizations in Mali, actually, in the central area of Mali, which is facing extreme atrocities and violence, and doing remarkable work in their communities. Um, coming out days after um, a mass violence attack on their communities to hold um, tea sessions under trees to bring parties together and, and have um, community building resilience efforts at youth-led initiatives. These are the kind of things that people are doing all around the world that we often don't see, uh, but it's happening. And, and so we're trying to figure out how best do we support it. Uh, another example you see, we, we do a lot in relationship to um, livelihoods and peace building actually, because although our policy system and our funding system likes to separate things into nice neat silos, like development funding for, um, you know, women's empowerment in one place and uh, funding for peace building in another place and funding for atrocity prevention in another place and funding for livelihoods and jobs and health and environment in very nice silos. The reality for people living in conflict contexts um, or any community context is that all these things are connected and related. So we've worked a lot in Somalia and also Nigeria in helping young people who might otherwise be recruited to armed groups to find jobs. You know, our partners there are um, building opportunities for young people to do something besides violence. And that is peace building and it's also livelihoods. Um, and in Somalia, you know, there, um, we had a partner who came in one of our advocacy visits. And just to give you a little story and I'll actually, I'll um, turn off my screen share now. 
if I can figure out how to do that. Hmm. Maybe I can't figure out how to do that. Sorry, just a second. There it is. I'm hiding too many things. Sorry. Okay. Um, so just to give you a, a little story, that's a little bit about sort of, you know, how we work as an organizational perspective. But just to give you a bit of perspective from a storytelling uh, example, we have a partner in Somalia uh, named Sado. And Sado has done a lot of this work on the intersection between livelihoods and peace building. And so they do jobs training, skills training for young people, um, also women and others, uh, connecting them with job skills and also doing conflict resolution and peace building training. That's not um, new. Lots of groups do things like that um, around the world. They're doing this in the context of, um, of Al-Shabaab and armed groups in Somalia and also an ongoing internationalized war. Uh, in Somalia that the U.S. is very uh, much a party to. And so we, we had our, an opportunity to bring our partners. Um, a man named Issei was the executive director of Sado at the time. We brought him and a woman named Halima from the w Somali Women's Solidarity Organization to Washington, D.C. Because we had held a peace exchange. This is our research, participatory research. We held a peace exchange with lots of groups, inviting them, local peace building groups there, to to share what's working, what's not, what are their needs, what peace building strategies are needed. We had a report, we bring that to policymakers, and we bring, we go alongside the partners so that they can speak directly to policymakers. And so we brought them to Washington and we had events and we went to the Hill and we had various meetings with the State Department and with other NGOs. And uh, they did an amazing job. And one of the things that um, I was always so impressed with Issei, about with Issei, um, was that he would speak and he had family in, in had gone to Ohio State University. So like many Somalis, um, he has this connection, this dual connection to Somalia and the US. So he would speak as a Somali peace builder and he would talk about the work with communities and he would talk about, um, you know, the impact that they were having um, to provide people alternatives to being pulled into violence. And then he would talk about US policy and he would say, you know, for the price of one drone strike in Somalia, I could train a thousand young people in job skills and give them the opportunity to be positive agents of change in their communities. And um, it was an uncomfortable conversation he was sparking because even we in the peace building field often want to um, speak about the positive work that peace builders are doing and the civilian side of peace building as we should because it doesn't get enough attention but we don't always want to talk about the hard edge of military action that's underway um, that is often undermining peace building work and particularly as u.s um citizen as a u.s citizen and, and organizations in the u.s peace direct really believes we need to be confronting these issues uh, and we need to be um, using our place and our access and our, our access to power in place to try to shift both sides of that picture. So um, Issei uh, went on and he was actually killed in the Mogadishu hotel bombing, which some people will remember um, last year. And he, I found out because um, his friends in Ohio, who I had met, um, texted me before the news came out, before anything, texted me and said, uh, our friend, our dear friend Issei has, has been killed. And it's just a story to tell, first to honor Issei, because I imagine him being grounded and centered and helping people in that situation up to the very end, because that's what local peace builders do. Um, and be, and also because it shows that at the core of everything for peace building is relationships and um, mutual accountabilities and building these networks of, I, I believe, global civil society connecting across um, one another in, in um, really um, deep and, and grounded ways and mutually accountable ways is the future of peace building. And that is um, what we aim to do. We don't always, um, certainly always do it um, perfectly or well at, at Peace Direct, but that is, I think, where peace building has its power. It's in relationships. 
and it's in the role of civil society and the role of people like Issei and many, many other local peace builders around the world who um, are on the front lines and are, are doing this work and who um, need to connect with the knowledge and the resources and the policy access that many folks here uh, on this panel have. So I just want to say, um, say, you know, thank you for letting me um, uh, speak here and kick this off. And I really look forward to hearing more and get engaging in discussion with you all. Thank you so much, Bridget. Um, and I think you've really demonstrated that a major objective of Peace Direct is to enskill civilians to become uh, agents for change, as it were. That is that is that they become the empowered to basically make positive change. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker, uh, Karina Corstellina, will present on um, communities as agents uh, of resilience. So, uh, Karina. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dan, uh, for organizing this session. It's it's such a uh, such a pleasure working with you and. Thank you for putting together such a wonderful panel and glad to see all colleagues and alumni together. So um, let me try to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we see it. Oh, wonderful. So when I will put also 12 minutes as, I, as you requested. Thank you for 12 minutes. Okay, I will try. <laughs> Everybody, I will everyone. Try. <laughs> Thank so, you. Uh, similar to what Bridget just told, <clears throat> this particular research concentrates on neighborhood, very small unit, and on resilience. So very quick idea of resilience approach. There are a lot of critique and also a lot of ideas how it can serve uh, peace building. Um, well, positive ideas is that it replaces ready-made blueprint with deep engagement with local resources, exactly uh, echoing what Bridget told, it's not always top-down, it's we really need to concentrate what actually people are doing in the uh, communities. It also recognizes that local communities possess available skills and knowledge, and it really promotes ideas of local ownership, capacity building, partnership, and so on. But there are also a lot of critique, which told it's uh, too neoliberal because it shifts responsibility to local communities and individual. It has some risk, and also it can have a negative forms. Uh, what is a disadvantage neighborhood, the unit of my analysis? <clears throat> it's... Uh, we can analyze it from the point of view there are a lot of literature on idea of pocket of fragility within the state even democratic states still have these pockets and they are really affected by structural inequality but in the same time they are very open dynamic adaptive system so they have this agency they self-organize self-govern and they produce their own practices as uh, institutions and collective actions. And we really need to understand that they have their own capacities to withstand <coughs> hardship, uh, which is produced by uh, societal uh, structural violence. And for, for me, it was very important that neighborhoods able to develop their own practices of resilience and reclaim their space from perpetrators of violence and deficiency. So main concept, um, I employ several concepts. Uh, resilience really perceived as a, not only capacity to address and resist conflict, but also active adaptation. And the most important for me is transformation processes. So it's a dynamic process, resilience are designed to help residents to reclaim their neighborhoods from perpetrators of violence, reduce impact of chronic urban violence on neighborhoods, and create space of well-being for all residents. And um, practices of resilience, this is what I analyze as a central, activities institutions developed, maintained by the community to help neighbors to address this conflict, um, Ad adopt and transform to from uh, the neighborhood. So I use a theoretical concept of four-loop model of resilience, where practices of resilience 
addressing structure of conflict, dynamics, identity, and power within the communities, uh, build on community capacities, and also on um, use of external resources. So the methodology of my research was based on research in four neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. And I work collaboration with Neighborhood Associate Corporation. I continue working with them. We're now developing in, in several other projects. I conducted together with support of students, uh, Oscar students, semi-structural interviews, and conducted a phenomenological analysis of their results. This is the um, demographic information. As you see, <clears throat> we have more females, and it's re re actually reflect demographic of these neighborhoods. Um, mostly were African American, some of them were Latina. Uh, and also in terms of age, you see like mostly we had um, people, middle age people from 30 to 70. Uh, <clears throat> so I will analyze, quickly describe these four loops that I was telling about. First loop, conflict loop. Interconnection between structure of conflict and practices of resilience. Idea of the loop is that uh, practices of resilience address structure of conflict, but at the same time, they change structure of conflict. So it's constant looping between these two. Uh, I would say spiral, I hope so, because um, we see how they actually able to transform conflict, which can show that it's going uh, up. Um, in terms of uh, resolution. So uh, when we speak about structure of conflict, what we see as um, structural issues and neighborhood level, it's psychological factors of dep uh, depression and hopelessness, which is very well described in the literature. Social factors, um, also very well described in the literature, norms of violence, criminal drug activity, and we also see structural factors, um, institutionalization of gangs, limited neighborhood resources, unemployment. So what uh, practices uh, the neighborhood uh, develops? And they, uh, one of the practices, um, set of practices address poverty. Such practices as community bank, community garden, employment for youth. Very interesting for community bank is not only uh, distribute money for um, people who are in need, but what was really uh, important and increased self-esteem of community is that they also distribute um, uh, money for celebration of birthdays or other achievements. It's very important. Came in young generation now of street. It was one of the major topic dis dis discussion in all interviews. And uh, parents and uh, people who live in community adults, they really go additional miles. They, Camp, they organize camping for kids, uh, sport programs, events and trips. Um, they run their own after school program and summer camp, which is completely organized by the community members. Uh, enhancing security, there is a neighborhood watch, um, but with, uh, and they also hire their own security guard and they pay it. The, there is collaboration with police, I will speak more about it. <clears throat> and also, uh, Community self-esteem was so important. The cleaning, for example, of the grounds where people come together and this practice which starts as a process where people just came together and start uh, cleaning the uh, uh, grounds around, then more and more people come in and become a social norm. And through this particular social norm, it's become a practice of resilience which increase self-esteem because they see that their grounds are cleanest around in, in comparison with other neighborhoods. And given this, uh, addressing this ideas of depression and hopelessness, they see that they are living actually in a very beautiful environment. Um, and by beautiful, because I will, they also have community garden and others. So second loop is uh, interconnection between external resources practice and, uh, and practices of resilience, again, we really have to understand the neighborhoods really live in um, this neighborhood, which we do research on, real, living in various situation of structural violence. The poverty, unemployment is very high. A lot of people on food stamps. 
and it's very important for them to utilize assistance program. So what are external resources? Multiple assistance program, government, uh, church programs, educational institutions, uh, police. <clears throat> and I want to um, share very important, interesting uh, practices collaboration with the police especially now when there are a lot of movement, Black like Lives Matter movements and a lot of information about police um, practices which are very violent and racist. In four communities which I was doing research, um, again, it, it was um, two years ago, but um, when we conducted all, almost all interviews, we didn't hear any um, negative words. Actually, the neighbor, neighbors are hosting police meetings in their community centers. They invite police to neighborhood meetings and police come, police uh, collaborate with young people, work with them. They even have a, a practice of young policemen of the, of the months where they choose somebody to be like a, a honored policeman from the youth. So is there a lot of this Japanese um, concept of embedded police in the communities and there are very good relationships. Uh, they also uh, share information. It's very important what we found in collaboration with uh, DC police and DC government specifically, that a lot of uh, pr um, programs are not uh, available because uh, neighbors do not know about them. It's all about information sharing. So they develop a lot of practices of information sharing like printing in, uh, some information and sharing, going to the meetings, just uh, world of the mouth sharing information and so on. And um, they provide, they invite a lot of organizations to their meetings, which is, they're very proactive and they give a lot of feedback, which is not usual for multiple neighborhoods. Um, community capacity loop, here we're speaking about how uh, community uh, increase their own capacity of social capital, social support, collective efficacy by multiple pro uh, practices of bonding, bridging practices, increasing efficacy, collective decision making. They collaborate with other neighborhoods. They go and teach other neighborhoods actually what to do and how to address issues. And final loop, identity and power loop, was very interesting for me because there are no literature at all on microdynamics of identity and power neighborhoods. They always perceive as very homogeneous group. And um, I was very interested in this. So I, I analyzed how salience of neighborhood identity and I, I wrote like the, high, the whole chapter how we describe neighborhood identity, but also social kinship, intergroup relations. Um, and we see how legitimacy and gender dynamic play a role um, just to give, to show you, uh, I will skip this, but um, as legitimacy come from very different. It's come from outside groups like church or neighborhood management, but we also see that older people uh, or people who are respected in community or people who have historic legacy being, for example, they name buildings after people who work in community. So buildings in this neighborhood named after community activists. Um, but what also we found that there are a lot of problems connected with um, dynamic of identity and power because people who have majority of legitimacy and power are usually older women. So it's impact how they work, girls are more included in community practices and uh, boys are mostly excluded in community practices. Also fathers very rarely participate in community practices unless it's cook off or something like this. And um, what it means that more groups have, some groups have more access to resources, other excluded. So within neighborhoods itself, this micro dynamics of identity and power impact which organizations they work with more, which resources they utilize. So it's not homogeneous approach and not everyone in neighborhood actually benefits the same way from the neighborhood resilience. And um, this is like table which show multiple um, repertoire of resilience practices. And this table really show how 
the resilience practices address Rockefeller Foundation idea of uh, neighborhood, uh, sorry, urban resilience. So the two um, circles inside the Rockefeller Foundation and then uh, outside circle is how I feed the resilience practices of neighborhoods into this urban resilience uh, concept. Okay, thank you very much. And I stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Karina. I mean, you really demonstrated both the complexity of resilience and its, centra its centrality in uh, moving forward. It's almost a, a deep element of their, of their lives, of the community life. Um, our next speaker, Arthur Romano, will present um, on grassroots peace building and structural violence in America's cities. So Arthur, do you want to unmute? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. I'm just gonna scare okay. my, share my screen here. Let's see, here we go. Okay. How does that look from your side? Can you see the slide? Perfect. Okay, well, I'm glad to be here. Good to see you all, my extended Carter School community. I'm, I'm uh, here in George Mason, Korea, so uh, nearing midnight uh, different in a different time zone, uh, and very excited to have this opportunity to share. Thank you for Karina for, for your presentation. You did a lot of the analytical work that is uh, I think really relevant to, to a, lo a lot of what I'll share. Um, I've chosen to go a route where I'm just going to talk a bit about different kinds of programs uh, that people are engaged in and, and some context around um, what civilian peace building looks like in the United States, especially at the grassroots level and in urban environments in response to structural violence. So I think, um, you know, oftentimes in, in conflict resolution or in the peace building discourse, um, we, we uh, sometimes skip the role of social movements and of antagonistic social action uh, and the role of, of protest uh, and, and organizing in shifting the dynamics of structural violence. Of course, that, that seems uh, a bit funny to say right now because those dynamics are front and center for us to see. Uh, I think it's a good place uh, to start uh, to begin with as well uh, in thinking about the important role that that plays for peace builders, right? For changing the context, for, for moving the goalposts of what social change is possible. So we see that across the United States right now in protests against police brutality and anti-black racism. Uh, th these movements have spread you know, from coast to coast and with uh, movements around the world in global solidarity. And social movements and, and protest and other forms of civil resistance play an important role, right? They help dramatize issues for groups that are not impacted by those issues to, to have a human face to the realities of structural violence. Structural violence is often diffuse, can be hidden, can be slow moving, can be overwhelming. Uh, you saw some of that in, in, um, in creating this presentation at the neighborhood level, so multi-layered, right? And so protests can take those elements of structural violence and bring them front and center for people to see. Uh, it also, they, you know, social movements play a really important role for peace building, uh, understanding the peace building context by, by shifting the, the power dynamics, by helping to shift the power dynamics. Uh, you know, we see right now that books about anti-racism and systemic racism are, are on the tops of, of best-selling books, the, you know, increase in, in people reading and getting active around these issues, including white people and people who are living in more privileged communities, right? So, Social movements also not only reach and, 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 and can win people over, but have what Bolding called integrative power. In fact, social movements in terms of street level protests are some of the most dynamic spaces that we can find in terms of breaking down uh, lines of class and race uh, in, as people are struggling together, working together on, on a street level. 
uh, for, for social movement scholars maybe, or for, for those of you that are activists, I think in some ways, we can almost take this for granted that we see academics and, and, uh, and people who are coming from all across the country convening in these kinds of moments. But it, oftentimes, social movements uh, and especially mass mobilization create a peace building opportunity as people transgress these lines uh, that separate us, these deep segregations and cleavages in our society that exist at the neighborhood level, if we're gonna talk about it at the neighborhood level, uh, social movements help perturb that, disrupt that and, and, and rearrange that at least temporarily. So we see that, you know, with the protest dramatize the issue, that it provides pressure to policymakers, what I'm talking about in terms of, uh, of moving the goalposts. Um, and then also provide an outlet for people to grieve with others and express their rage, anger, and concern. So there's a kind of public pedagogy of truth telling that takes place in these contexts. And then also, of course, that people see that they're not alone, right? And, and we see this, that people's thresholds when they're in, when in, in moments where they're engaged in large scale um, mobilization and or see others that are taking to the streets or, or uh, lobbying or engaging in other activities that people's thresholds for participation, that that threshold gets lowered and that they're inspired to engage with other people. So, and to take courageous action. So it's not that we're born courageous, that we become courageous and, and, and we are willing to take risks and, and that, that willingness takes place in a, in a wider social context. And social movements play a critical role in that. So in my own experiences, I wanted to talk just about firsthand, some firsthand um, experiences and projects that I've worked with that I think highlight some of the trajectories of civilian peacemaking uh, in the United States as it relates to systemic racism and structural violence. Uh, here I, I wanted to talk to begin with about the truth telling project and, and the role of truth telling about systemic racism and police and police violence. So the truth telling project grew out of the Ferguson protests in 20, 2014. A uh, grassroots effort uh, organized in St. Louis by local activists and educators and academics. I was involved in the, at the founding level with that project. Uh, and really, mo many people don't know this, but in Ferguson, there were nonviolent protests and, and unarmed protesters on the streets for a year continuously, which as far as I can see is one of the most longstanding continuous nonviolent protests since the Montgomery bus boycotts, which lasted over a year. And in that ongoing and sustained process of, of resistance, activists being dealing with pepper spray and police uh, and, and, all, and incarceration and, of, and, and ongoing repression, um, there was a need for, that activists expressed to be able to grieve together to be able to, to have community and to share experiences of police violence in a supportive environment that was different than the confrontational realities of street protest. Uh, and from that really, um, the, the truth pro telling process was born. Uh, so a key component of it is those of you who study or have been involved with um, truth and reconciliation processes will be very familiar with this, is testimony. And so um, there was a process whereby People came originally from, from Ferguson and St. Louis area, but then from across the country and shared their experiences and the Im impacts of those experiences um, on family members and loved ones who have had, um, who've experienced police violence before. Also, there was the integration of the use of arts, ritual and other activities to help support healing in those uh, events. And then a, a kind of workshop setting where different groups that were activist groups that were working on police reform could, uh, could get together and people who had heard testimony could then learn about how to, ways that people were organizing and trying to shift police violence and other related issues uh, in the United States. So this was kind of, was grounded in, in a critical race pedagogy, a kind of public pedagogy is what I call it. Um, of Ferguson where we you know, acknowledge that concealed narratives about race are, are core part of transformational learning. And street protest allows for telling those stories uh, you know, of people who are interested in peace building in one way, but truth telling allows for a kind of deeper exploration of the impacts of, the, of, of violence in people's lives and the, and the courageousness of, that people are engaged in in trying to influence change. Uh, the importance of centering race in those conversations, not just having it be an add-on, 
uh, and, and, co and contextualizing structural violence, um, uh, people's experience of police violence in the wider context of structural violence. So we always ask people in, the, in their testimony, why did you think, why do you think this happened? Um, and oftentimes people spoke about the larger structural conditions in which uh, this took place. Um, and then also about thinking about more positive futures that are rooted in social justice, right? What would a world without police violence look like? Uh, what is justice? And having those kinds of wider um, conversations. So those of you, some of you will be familiar with Leanne Bell's model on uh, storytelling for social justice, that we have these stock stories that we tell about race or about policing, um, let's say in this case, and that there are concealed stories that we often don't hear. And so by centering this process on, on um, uh, you know, on black people who have, and others who have experienced, other people of color have experienced police violence, we had to kind of surface those concealed stories, the stories of how it's impacted family members across generations and these other aspects that are often hidden and connect that with the resistance stories. This is where people are organizing and have organized, right, from the very founding of, this, of the United States uh, to resist these dynamics and work to change them, right? And by unearthing these concealed stories and joining them with these resistance stories, we start to have the possibility uh, and increase the possibilities for peace building in terms of shifting policy and shifting wider social narratives, right? And we've seen that that's been successful. That's part of the silver lining of this moment, right? It, it, the, the, the difficult part is that we haven't seen substantive change in police uh, policy and behavior at a national level resulting in less police shooting. So we still have a long way to go. But six years ago, just 43% described uh, those deaths as indicative of a broader problems in policing, right? And 51% saw those as isolated incidences where more than two in three Americans, a whopping 69% said that Floyd's killing represents a broader pro problem in law enforcement, right? So that's just in five short years. Um, so so truth-telling uh, is, is a critical component for unearthing and, and, and recognizing those structural uh, violence that's taking place for people to kind of come together uh, in solidarity with each other and connect with organizations for, uh, in civilian peace building with organizations that are working to disrupt and change those those dynamics of violence. Um, but then also there's the component of sustaining this kind of local resistant, resistance and envisioning and building alternative futures, right, where protest moments and large-scale mobilization are relatively uh, short-lived. Uh, and there we see a lot of interesting work happening across the United States. I just wanted to highlight a couple other projects in addition to truth-telling. And by the way, um, I'm, I'm proud to say that students at the Carter School worked in a peace lab that, uh, in my class where we developed a truth-telling toolkit because at the time, uh, following uh, Michael Brown, the killing of Michael Brown and the development of that project, there were so many communities across the country that were interested in doing truth-telling uh, and, and there are many great stories about groups that did true telling events, uh, took testimony, are doing ongoing restorative justice work uh, uh, in their communities. Um, so, so we see in the U.S., right, and in, in those at the neighborhood level, uh, the development of projects are at, that are similar to zones of peace in the international context. Uh, in what is often called the, the harm-free zone projects or harm-free zone movement. Um, so this is where people are taking, you know, a geographical area in the neighborhood and seeking to, to disrupt the dynamics very intensively of, of violence taking place there. I'm highlighting an organization called Spirit House in Durham, North Carolina here uh, that has, you know, committed to this harm-free zone project uh, over the past decade and grounding it in specific principles. Uh, that around addressing proactively addressing harm, uh, rotating positions of leadership uh, and positions of power, developing restorative justice response mechanisms and democratic dialogue. Uh, it's a it's what it's, Spirit House is run uh, uh, by Black women uh, and has sustained this kind of localized work around developing zones of peace uh, for for nearly a decade. Um, so. There, we're really looking at a, a kind of movement across the United States where people are developing an increasing capacity for restorative justice, right? Including building on the strength community strengths, where you can have response mechanisms 
to deal with harm that do not necessarily re require a referral from the criminal justice system. So, it, so people are now, you know, have been working really hard and in part, you know, and, and, and Karina raised this around issues with the state, in part because of distrust with the state, right, um, around having responsive mechanisms and proactive mechanisms to deal with harm um, so that it does, th those referrals don't have to come from the criminal justice system. At the same time, uh, and this has been true of Spirit House in Durham, they're also working really hard with the uh, district attorney and others to try to bring restorative justice into those systems so less people are funneled uh, into the prisons, prison industrial complex. So a point here that echoes what um, Bridget said at the beginning uh, in the international context is that any, all these changes in agency as people are organizing at the local, local level are really being actively negotiated with ongoing disruptions as a result of systemic racism. And that's a critical part of doing this work. Uh, I have a kind of uh, enduring image in my head from the work in North Carolina in Chapel Hill uh, around Harm Free Zone Project where a group of young women, teenagers, 14, 15 years old, were leading, leading a conversation about community strengths and about how to proactively respond to harm in the community, in a public housing community, and police just saw a group of people underneath a tree and came flying up in the police car, came to a screeching halt only to find, you know, not anyone armed, but these young women armed only with a Sharpie and, and a flip chart paper underneath this tree, right? So it kind of this, this way that these, this work uh, smacks right up against these overwhelming realities uh, of, of systemic racism in the United States. So the last uh, project that I wanted to talk about is uh, the Connecticut Center for Nonviolence, which is doing work around nonviolence education uh, in Hartford in Connecticut uh, and is a good example of this. How do you try to, what do you need to do to try to sustain this kind of civilian peace building in the urban environment uh, with structural violence? And you see the structural violence is quite stark. In Hartford, New Haven, and Bridgeport combined, they're home to 67% of hom homicides, 62% of armed robbers, robberies, 92% of students attending Hartford public schools are living in poverty and 92% of those students are youth of color. Now, when I give this talk in international context, people ask to fact check this component um, because they can't believe that 90% of the children would live below the poverty line in public schools. But it's the case as Connecticut is the richest country in the world, uh, is the richest state and the richest country in the world, but also one of the most highly segregated. Uh, and in these projects, students learn about the legacy of, of Dr. King and, and concrete principles for engaging in nonviolence. But what's important here, I think, from a civilian peace building lens is that uh, this is a community education model, kind of like um, serving as a public intellectuals. These young people and other community members uh, steep themselves in, in nonviolent action and history, uh, and, and especially with analysis of systemic racism. And then they train other community members in nonviolence and host educational events. Over 10,000 people have come through these projects over the last 10 or so years uh, in Hartford and New Haven um, uh, with a curriculum that focuses on conflict analysis and resolution as well as nonviolent social action. And it's not just youth that are involved. People come from all walks of life to be, and are trained as um, nonviolence educators from professors to street level violence interrupters uh, and from a wide variety of, of backgrounds, multi-generational, uh, multiracial uh, and and creating a kind of peace uh, learning community across these really deeply um, violence affected uh, cities. Um, and finally, the last component of civilian peace building, which uh, grabs a lot of press attention and wor is worth mentioning here in the urban context, is is actually the kind of rapid response, uh, violence interrupters, nonviolent peace responses to harm. These are folks, uh, ceasefire is famous in Hartford and, and uh, it, there's a, uh, they're literally called peace builders, right, where they intervene um, with parties that are potentially armed and try to disrupt violence at the point in which uh, it, it's likely to break out and with the high, most high risk groups. So we see in the U.S. what is a really kind of complex um, mix of civilian peace building. And this is where I want to close. Uh, just by saying now as we enter into this kind of conversation about defunding the police, we're really hearing uh, this point here in the, that I see here in this picture that, you know, that we're over policing in response to a wide range of deeply rooted social issues. 
and that we've extended too far out the security approach to those to those issues, right? And so as that pressure mounts and as uh, the social movements move the goalposts of that conversation where, you know, the conversation has shifted dramatically just from the time that um, of Ferguson in terms of what's on the table in terms of possible response, then we see that having these, these grassroots and localized uh, mechanisms and processes and community members leading creates uh, the possibility for sh when there's large shifts in funding uh, for something to be funded, right? Uh, the, I think the, the really difficult part and part of an important part of, of the challenge for our field is that when we think about the deeply rooted systemic problems that we face in the United States, um, what, what is required in terms of scale of intervention to deal with deep rooted poverty and issues of structural violence in cities is on a scale that we are nowhere near um, funding at a necessary level. Uh, and so this, the conversation around defunding the police uh, is still also in, in a context in which even that funding is but drops in the bucket of what is necessary in terms of a holistic uh, and sustained response to, to structural violence in America City. And I think that's part of our, of our challenge is to, is to highlight uh, this work and, and uh, where it's working and what its challenges are, but also to really up the ante in, in helping to understand the incredible scale of intervention uh, and scale of local support that's necessary for us to have a, a, a chance at uh, shifting these deeply rooted dynamics of violence in the US. Thank you so much, Arthur with so much valuable, um, a, a rich presentation, then I hope uh, will spark uh, discussion. Um, Me too. And so next we have Mark Gopin, who will speak on compassionate reasoning, a core skill of civilian peacemakers for a sustainable future. Mark? Um, right, wonderful. Um, well, I'll share a screen soon. Um, I just want to have a chat uh, at first with uh, with with folks about this subject. Um, and, oh, and I'm putting on my timer so I don't go over too much, uh, Dan. Uh, wonderful presentations. I learned so much from all three of them, and I uh, uh, they 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 all confirm so many of the things that in our field we. It's just music to my ears to hear all of these these processes confirmed. I come at I come at the question very a, a little bit differently at, at this stage of my life, at this stage of my my learning from working all, for decades with civilian peace builders, and that is that um, I come with a great deal of a great many questions about civilian peace building and then backlash and the conflicting narratives that create counter reactions to civilian efforts that actually create far more violence. And that once you try to be in that in-between space between those narratives, you, cut, you get to some pretty depressing uh, moments when you realize that the righteousness on, on multiple sides is very, very strong. It, that structural violence is not always because of of corruption, it, in, it indeed is based on on many things that involve greed and corruption, but it also involves a sense of righteousness that has partial evidence that continues cycles of violence. And so there are, as, as Arthur said, there are eruptions and moments of mass mobilization, but there is equally mass moments of reaction and destruction of everything that was built. It is quite sobering to think about 500,000 Americans dead in the Civil War uh, and so much effort before that for abolition of slavery and then so much excitement in the 60s and 70s uh, to build uh, uh, an African-American middle class and have success in so many cities only for it to all be dirt burned down in Jim Crow only for the reaction to basically be that the, the liberation and the opportunities were enormous and there was excitement and there was mobilization and then there was absolute destruction. We are wit living through a similar process right now uh, after uh, um, a sense uh, on, on many people's parts that 
somehow we turn a corner that the structures were still there, the poverty was still outrageous, the, uh, the, the ridiculous militarization of policing was, was going to turn a corner after 9-11 somehow uh, with uh, people like Barack Obama in, in presidency, and then only to go through what we've gone through, uh, the horror we've gone through since 2015. Many, many other millions of people who are civilian peace builders all over the globe have gone through similar cycles. And that led me and, and, and got very depressed about it, burnt out, apathetic, et cetera. So after all the things that I went through in terms of the disappointment of peace processes and their destruction in both uh, Israel, Palestine, and in Syria, and in Afghanistan, uh, and other places, I, um, I, I started to go more deeply into psychosocial questions of who is resilient and who persists in building bridges and who does not. And that led me uh, into, uh, 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 because the, the basic theory is that, that in the places that clinch this and actually get to permanent peace treaties and permanent change, there are, there are sustainable peace builders in each place that have, in my opinion, a series of psychosocial qualities that uh, uh, allow them to build bridges uh, beyond enemy boundaries, beyond enemy lines. And in fact, you know, in my, in my center in CRDC, we're experimenting, exploring with this, both in terms of the Syrian context, but also uh, we pioneered work with uh, conservative, um, conservative uh, spiritual peace builders uh, who are uh, mainline church folks who are deeply into uh, racial reconciliation. Uh, what does that look like to be in between as they are? Uh, what does it look like for, for police who are, who are actively working on the streets in peace building? What is, it, what, what is the burnout? What is the, the, the experience of being in a no man's land where, where neither side trusts you or likes you? Um, that, that's, this, this is what fascinated me. And so I decided to go and develop um, based on uh, neuroscience and, and social psychology an approach to, to, to change that involves um, compassion and reasoning. And so I'm, I've developed a, a, here, let me, let me just uh, share a screen for a minute to just do a little bit of show and tell. Um, So at this point, um, this, is, uh, this is the work that's going to come out from Oxford soon on changing the mind to change the world. And, uh, and you see that, that ethical decision make, making is a key. Uh, habits, uh, the way the, the, the world changes through mental habits that lead to social habits, uh, applied ethics and conflict resolution, and social networks, uh, science and positive change. Uh, but I also wanted to share with you um, just um, the, uh, some questions that I have on the question, the problem of righteousness, which Haight, uh, Jonathan Haidt uh, raises a lot in his writings, but, but he doesn't take you to some solutions. And that is that in terms of ethical decision making, we, even as fellow practitioners of social justice and social change, there is no consensus or, or, or developing the communic communication skills to even talk about how we come to ethical conclusions on critical matters of life and death, on critical matters of justice uh, and peace, on critical matters of how to make change in a very dangerous situation. Um, should feelings dominate or logic? Do principles matter more than consequences, et cetera, et cetera? So I'm looking actually to develop these skills and to incorporate them into peace building in a new way, which is indeed what we're what we've been doing uh, in various um, uh, in various locations. So this is just an example of some of the work that we've been we we did when there was absolutely no solution to the genocide in Syria. We worked mainly with women and children on resilience and on empowerment through um, through love and compassion, combined with. With um, with education in in uh, in in conflict resolution and other skills, um, 
I just looking, oh yeah, it's over here. This is, uh, this is, a, this is uh, the people we work closely with in Syria. And you see it goes all the way from rather advanced meetings of, of the opposition uh, where they've never met before because conflict is so embedded in the way in which people resist that, that it was only these women and actually the children's project that brought the men together to actually debate a consistent approach to a principled approach to opposition that would encourage democracy and pluralism and diversity. Um, these are some of the, the children that we work with. Um, but, and this is much of this is based on a neuroscience approach to, um, gosh, I'm having problems with my, my clock. Um, uh, a neuroscience approach to understanding the good and the bad of the brain when it comes to both reasoning and how reasoning can be distorted without you knowing it because of other parts of your brain working on it in negative ways versus ways in which pro-social emotions enhance reasoning. And this is, uh, this is just uh, some wonderful work uh, by Klemecki on, on empathy and compassion. And one of the things that, we've re that, that has been a surprise but a great explanation for me is empathy, empathic distress versus compassion. Because I discovered that 99% of the people that I worked with who burnt out were based on empathic distress, on self-related emotions, negative feelings, poor health, burnout, withdrawal and non-social behavior that led them to become part of the problem as peace builders. Whereas those who had focused on a compassionate focus of training and training themselves in that worked far, far better in building coalitions across lines of opposition, but also across lines of opposition groups, across lines of, in, of, of, of victim groups, but also across enemy lines. That those who focused on compassion, their reasoning was better. Their ability to come to an ability to bring the violence to a close was far, far better. So my friends and I in various countries are instigating a new approach to not only compassionate reasoning, but conflict resolution education embedded in the mind and consciousness of people from the age of five all the way through the teenage years, so that the very way of thinking about diplomacy and conflict resolution and big treaties, for example, is that those big treaties are not going to be focused just on security or just on who gets the biggest oil contracts, but actually on who we hate together, which is typical of international relations, but it's going to be embedded in the very nature of the relationship between people. And a training in that from the highest level to the level of the street. Because it's our experience that in every conflict we've been in, there are very legitimate reasons why people join enemy camps. Uh, and there are very legitimate reasons why there's no solution. And that the only people we see actually working on third ways are those with these emotional intelligence skills that combine their ability to reason through problems, reason through ethical dilemmas, but do it in the context of relationship, love, and compassion. So that, that's, that's where we feel, we'll, uh, we, we're, uh, that's where I'm experimenting in the field with a new approach to this, with police in the United States, with, peace co with uh, a racial uh, reconciliation atonement commissions in different places um, where uh, CRDC is now working deeply in Charlotte, North Carolina with the African-American leadership and community there. And everywhere we, 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 we think and we feel that the people with those deep skills are the ones who are able to build coalitions better, build the community better to have buy-in, but also the ones who are more adept at reaching out uh, across, across lines of structural uh, divisions. And that, that place across those structural lines is, is in the end where, uh, where um, progress can be made. Um, finally, I'm interested in progress that does not create backlash. I'm interested in escaping from cycles of history where we have sudden new successes and legislation and it's all very exciting and then it's all smashed because we didn't create a coalition uh, across enemy lines with the very people who have the most 
um, violent attitudes and the most sense of righteousness about their cause. So that's the exploration that I'm doing now. I don't believe there's any society that is post-conflict or post-violence. Everybody is either is who's post is also pre. And so I think this panel and what our lessons are not only about what to do with post-conflict, it's what to do to avoid the next cycle of conflict. So that's it. And uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. A powerful presentation as, as you frequently give. And I um, will move on to uh, my own presentation, the themes of which intersect closely. I'm always inspired by your work, Mark. Um, and I will... I hope this can be seen. Can someone confirm that this is shared? No, we don't see it yet. No. Ah. Yeah, box. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to start with a big picture question. Um, what is conflict transformation? Clearly, our field some decades ago created a revolution in relation to realism in international relations, a revolution that centered on the whole person perspective rather than just defining war and peace in terms of power dynamics. The whole person perspective really uh, compels us to look at interactions, uh, thoughts, and emotions, and how the th these three domains, of course, are not separate, but interrelated. But I think, and what has happened in our field is enormous and deep intersection between peace building and psychological models of aggression. That is the whole person perspective has been deeply embedded in the reflection, reflective practice, in the understanding of conflict agitators and the, as it were, downward spiral of violence. But what our field has not done very well, in fact, barely at all, is looking at the perspective of positive social emotions. I think the field really has a half person, whole person perspective in retrospect. That the, there's been almost revolutionary changes in psychology uh, about the centrality of positive emotions as, as, a, as a critical aspect of, of interaction of human life. There's almost no deep, deeply reflective, empirically sound and current research on positive emotions in peace building. Um, it, and yet, it, Peace builders are frequently showcasing uh, anecdotal evidence that trust building was achieved from a, a, a short workshop, positive relations, and so on. Some of the anecdotal evidence, I think, is relatively shallow. There, in my literature review, I found only two people in our field who really engage in this deep intersection between peace building and as it were the moral psychology of positive emotions. Um, Adomi, Le Adomi Lesham has become an expert on hope and of course Mark Gopin on compassion as we just heard. That conflict transformation is rarely guided by 
advanced understanding of positive emotions. So we need to do some work here. Um, and in, as Mark eloquently presented, uh, the compassion is so critical for positive change in, um, in violent communities. And yet, this is not only a new discovery. In fact, there have been over thousands of years insights and wisdom from various sectors of human thought. Obviously, religion, the Abrahamic faith traditions have placed compassion for those who are suffering um, at the center of religious ethics. Um, and Mark has written eloquently about that. C compassion in moral philosophy is a primary virtue, that should be virtue, not virtual, uh, for living in right relations with each other. In psychology, compassion is a distinct positive emotion, which consists of a combination of sympathetic understanding for those suffering and a hope for their relief. And in neuropsychology, the neuroscience, humans are hardwired for compassion, and critically, compassion can be induced under certain conditions. So, uh, and this picture just encapsulates the theme from neuroscience that um, compassion is actually correlates, that is the feeling of compassion, the experience of compassion correlates to certain processes in the brain, which are indicated by these red uh, spots here in this diagram. So, um, so what does that mean for peace building? Well, first of all, Peace building as a field is a field of compassion practices. And as, as Bernard Mayer writes, our values are the source of our dedication and the compass that guides our work, the essential glue of our field. Um, compassion underpins the human rights agenda. It underpins many of the techniques of facilitated conflict resolution practices, interactive conflict resolution. And it also underpins the work of certain communities um, seeking peace, experiencing violence, as, as um, Susan Allen and I demonstrated uh, last year in, a, in an article. Um, but what we have not done, if I may go back, our article was very kind of generic, generic and uh, broad based. What we have not done is test our model in any specific context. And so with that, um, I embarked uh, two years ago on the first case study of compassion, the first, as it were, laboratory for peace, case study of compassion among conflict actors. So we um, interviewed 23 students, and seven of whom were alum, 23 students from a peace education center called Rondonay Citadel for Peace. Rondonay is a uh, site where young people from conflict-ridden countries uh, live, they experience, they learn, they go through, in effect, a, a deep experiential transformation. It's a two-year certificate program in peace building. In, uh, this is the most um, demanding and intense experience in conflict transformation that uh, I'm aware of in the world. After graduation, students return to their homes to grow the seeds of peace. So just a so very brief information about our study. We had 16 students that I interviewed 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, and seven plus seven alumni. And uh, the result was very interesting, to some degree surprising. A majority of participants expressed compassion for the enemy. We asked them, do you have compassion for the enemy militants in your home country? That was the major question. And we had a whole series of questions, of course. Um, and the interview, each interview took uh, about 45 minutes to an hour. 
So the results are that 10 of the participants express clear and unqualified compassion for enemy militants. That, and these are people who the students knew were killing innocent people, um, in some cases, so-called terrorist uh, groups. Eight of the participants expressed limited con compassion, which I'll explain what that, th that means. That it was, it was um, ambivalent that they were compassionate in some respects, but also um, uh, castigating them in other respects. Five participants expressed no compassion at all for the enemy militants. Um, so of the 10, and I'll go through this quickly, of the 10 participants who expressed clear and un, uh, unquestioned compassion, what, there were three themes from thematic analysis. First, everyone engulfed in violence, uh, everyone, everyone engulfed in violence in the conf of the conflict suffers. And in one case, says uh, a young woman from Colombia talk about the FARC, I do feel sympathy and I do feel pain for those and so on. I need to move on quickly for time. Um, second theme, militants are victimized by central government, that the militant, enemy militants on both sides of the gun are victimized by their government propaganda. This was conveyed especially by people in um, uh, the Russia and Georgia and the Caucasus. A third theme, there's no real enemy. The notion of an enemy represents a fabrication is the third theme. And just the eight participants expressed limited compassion. That means that to some degree they were, gave a rationalization um, that one soldier, one participant said the soldiers told me I don't want to fight and so on. And then on the other hand, another theme was that that the militants could not be justified in their violence. Um, and interestingly, of the 23 people, there were two people from Israel, Palestine. They were uh, among the five out of 23 who were most resistant to compassion for their enemy. These were two Palestinian participants who recognized the enemy as settlers. Um, in, uh, in particular in the West Bank, and they don't feel sorry for them. So the takeaway themes are as follows, that conflict transformation really requires that we understand positive emotions by drawing upon at least four long-term traditions, um, religious ethics, moral philosophy, social psychology, neuroscience. Second, the norm of compassion reflects an ethics of caring for those who are suffering, and I think that ethic really is central to the defining mission of peace building. Third, the norm of compassion is central to peace building, as I mentioned. And yet compassion also raises questions about our positionality. That is, compassion is not just other centric, it is also self uh, reflective. What is my relation to the, those suffering? What is our responsibility? How should we act? These are questions that I think are central to reflective practice. So that is it. Thank you for being attentive. Um, so now we will open this up for discussion. Questions, comments from any, anybody, anyone else participating? Obviously, please unmute your mic, uh, or you can raise your hand, obviously, and I will recognize you. That's what we should do. Please raise your hand. At the bottom, it says reaction on the bottom icon. So I recognize you. I see Mary, Kate, Walt, Walt. Yes, Walt? Hi. hi. Yes, Walt. If it, Sorry. it's hard to pronounce. No, that's okay. Sorry. It's an odd name. I, my question is for Karina. I was wondering. It, it sounded like a lot of the neighborhoods you were working with were in the United States, and you had mentioned Washington D.C. And I wondered where else you've worked or where else you had done your neighborhood projects. 
Yeah, they're all in the area. Um, three of them in Washington, D.C. and one in Arlington. In Washington, D.C., they were predominantly African-American with some people from Latino community. And uh, in Arlington, it was 99% Latino community. Thank you. But we're planning, we're planning, we're just looking for more funding because the neighborhood associates corporation, which I'm working with, uh, they have multiple communities across the United States. And we actually now planning uh, writing projects uh, on working in Baltimore. They have um, several communities in Baltimore. And we expanding our research into ideas that what I mentioned that fathers and boys are excluded and it's also influenced their health a lot so we're actually working now with several health organizations health related organizations public health how to work on the inclusion of boys and fathers into community practices to increase health wow thank you for for that follow-up Um, Kate Rodman. Hi. Uh, my question is for Mark. Uh, you talked about the the compassionate reasoning and not wanting to generate a backlash. Can you give some examples where um, that has been effective? Um, I think it's a great model, and I think um, the backlash um, is very the righteousness and the backlash is very um, applicable to current U.S. Uh, situation. So, can you even give some microcosms or bigger pictures? Yeah, what interests me is, I mean, I, what I, the, the examples are, there's so many people of high quality who've managed to do this as extraordinary peace builders. And so I've written a lot of case studies about those kind of people. Some of them are secular, some of them are religious, some of them are leaders of, of countries. Uh, you know, Jimmy Carter had this capacity uh, when he was putting together leaders to to not only speak in a reasonable way, but to demonstrate a kind of um, methodology that evoked compassion, evoked a greater identification, and he thus, he thus prevented the breakdown of relations. He did this with, uh, at a critical moment between Begin and Sadat. And I realized a while ago that the tragedy of elite forms of international diplomacy and peace building is that they get the combination of compassion and reasoning. They do it all the time behind closed doors in palaces and other places. They, they never just uh, pronounce something. They, it, it's always eating and drinking and family sharing and the people, this happened between Arafat and, and Rabia, for example. But the deep mistake of both men, but as, you know, uh, there was no, democratic process that would have required a greater social justice and structural conversation of putting millions of people together to go through what Arafat and Rabin and their families went to together, which is, which is a catastrophe that we see ongoing. That had the compassion between those two families gotten deeper and gotten structure and went down, it would have changed history completely. And it is the same with Begin and Sadat. It never went deeper. No one allowed it to go deeper between the Egyptian community and the uh, Israeli community uh, because of all these other complications. So what I'm, what I, and then there is many, many examples of people on the ground who have these capacities. So you see uh, extraordinary, um, I'm working with uh, extraordinary police officers right now who are African American and they're, you know, they're deeply frustrated by, 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 the, by the bad apples. They're not, they're not looking at structures so much. They are looking at good policing and bad policing. And they're also very frustrated by the fact that people don't appreciate how much they're doing to engage uh, people who are at risk. Poor kids, they've adopted kids, sometimes even unofficially in order to transform their lives in a very dangerous situation. They feel they get no credit for that. So you see how they're showing great compassion. They are reasoning through the issues of criminality at risk or kids at risk. 
they often were that at one age themselves, but then they feel isolated from the very people who are protesting the things that they agree with. So there is a, there's a gap here between compassionate reasoning and the ability or the bridges that the rest of us are not creating. We've also seen that in the Syrian case where the women have great capacity across ethnic lines, religious lines, uh, class lines to build solidarity, especially through the care for children. But they, 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 there is, I haven't found a way, there's no safe mechanism right now for them to appreciate they know in theory that there are people who joined the, the, who ran away or who joined the regime because they were afraid of the, of the other side. They, had, they felt they had no choice. I, it's so dangerous, I haven't even found a way to get them in the same room, to give you an example, because our field doesn't really get it. The world doesn't get how important those kind of safe meetings could be in terms of building a, a, you know, a third way beyond ruthless regimes on the one side and people who authentically are stuck you know, in camps. So we have many, many amazing peace builders, but I think structurally we're still not working on this compassion and reasoning across enemy lines. Okay, um, Audrey Williams. Hi all, um, thank you for this, these fantastic presentations. I have a lot of notes um, and will be very excited hopefully to see the recording of this so I can go back. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm only gonna ask one obviously. Um, and it's, it's, some, it's related to something you just said, Mark, when you kind of drew out specifically, um, you know, women in the, in the Syrian context and conflict contexts. And I, I have a lot of hope about this, um, you know, ethics of caring and, you know, compassionate reasoning. And I also wonder, can we really make this turn um, without addressing all of the different ways and the gendered ways specifically that compassion is considered weak or considered less than, or has, you know, you know, how are we um, interrogating that? And I, I guess, how do, how do we go forward and interrogate that? Um, yeah, that's my question. I, I am sorry, I have to leave. I have a Prabhu, meeting with Prabhu, oh. whatever it is, virtual sorry, we, line. We are, we are going yeah. late. Yeah. Sorry, okay. Karina. Okay. okay, thank you very much. It was wonderful. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, everyone. Sorry, wonderful I have to see. leave. Karina. Thank you. Um, I don't want to, uh, Dan, I, well, yeah. I, can, I can address that, but uh, does anybody else want to address that first from the panel? Uh, I want to address it, but you go first. Oh, you go first. Uh, no, you, <laughs> okay. Sorry, we often. You're, you're my, you're, 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 my elder, you're, you're my mentor in many ways. No, no, no. Um, uh, thank you, Audrey, for your excellent question. One of the challenges here is to convince people in power, let me put it directly, convince them not to be stupid. And what I mean is just that they're, there's such a strong tendency among people in power to focus only on instrumental rationality. Here we have a, uh, an instrument. This is going to be applied in this context. Now we'll see change and then we have to see the costs and the, the, the benefits and so on. This is basically exactly the kind of thinking that all of us on the panel today are trying to undercut and to really focus each of us, uh, Karina on resilience, Arthur's w important work and Mark, um, are basically uh, drawing, it's not just attention, but demanding that sustainable peace requires understanding human beings. And, um, and, and there's that of course is a complicated message. So, Part of our job is to convince people in power to, um, to stop being segmented about the communities in which they're trying to, quote, save. Yeah, um, so let me just also respond to it uh, quickly. Um, it, so uh, Audrey, this is exactly what, would, what should require more thought and more, more, more sharing and more brainstorming, because I think there are 
answers to this in terms of our detailed practice. Uh, there's no question that either, both in democracies and non-democracies, it's an easy appeal to, uh, to make men far worse in their behavior by making compassion or pro-social emotions into a weakness. There is a construct, a mental construct around that. It, it, I, I have my doubts that it's, that it's genetic, uh, the differences here, but whatever it is, it is obviously a driving force in the ability to help men to be aggressive and to kill and to organize as killing forces or, or, or aggressive forces. Since the opposite of that is some of what I'm talking about. The irony is that I have worked a lot with military and police and that as uh, people age, you see the extraordinary qualities of people who have had to use force in their lives and have to live with it for 20 years and they become wiser on emotional intelligence. They become wiser on compassion. And, and, uh, and because of the people they've had to bury, for the people they've lost. And so I find this among police as well, and that the critical danger in, is, the, is the teenage to, to, to 40 years of age, and the manipulations of both media, which, which uh, Mary has just mentioned, and the manipulations of, of demagoguery and democracy in terms of bringing out the worst in certain constituencies. You know, there's no question that if you look at the constituencies right now, the biggest, the biggest bump for the most demagogic approach to politics right now is, is uh, a considerable majority of white men and, and uh, who are in a position of privilege uh, built in. And, and that, that's where, and, and, and compassion or anti-compassion has been a key component of this campaign as never before. So I just, um, I think this is fixable. I think we have to become, I, I've seen us develop rituals and skills and subtle ways of both men and women together who find uh, companions within leadership, ambassadors here and there, police here and there, who become part of the compassionate reasoning. I worked amazingly with a policeman from the Gulf last semester in my class great work on domestic violence prevention, et cetera. And he's a kind, wonderful police officer in the Gulf. Uh, you, 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 we have to become more self-conscious of cultivating this, and then it starts to happen. My experience in this field is that once you become self-conscious of something missing, it takes about 10, 20 years, and then it starts to happen on a structural level. Okay, let me recognize Bridget Moy. Do you want to? Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, I just wanted to jump in. Um, and I'm also going to have to jump off after this okay. comment. But um, I just want to make sure you know, um, Audrey, about the feminist foreign policy movement, because I think there is a policy and structural um, layer to this that needs to be challenged. And there is an active movement for a feminist foreign policy, um, which I think is a really important piece of this, of this change. And it goes, you know, I don't think that the structural change is going to come through the peace building field. I mean, I think we're more already trying to grapple with this, but the sort of international affairs, traditional international affairs, foreign policy, politics field, it's, I mean, you know, it's, pers it, as Mark was saying, it's, you know, gendered everything and how we're raised as people, but also just through academic institutions, through the policy formation, you know, all of that is built in in a very um, gendered way. And so I think we have to actually sort of reconstruct foreign policy to be, you know, feminist, to be anti-racist. I mean, there's, there's a lot of layers that we're going to have to work on, but there are efforts underway. So just wanted to flag that for you and, um, and encourage you to, to look into that too. So thank wonderful. you everyone. It's been wonderful. I'm sorry. Thank I've you. Gotta, I've got thank you, Bridget. Uh, we have gone way over. Um, I just want to thank the panelists for outstanding presentation. Very exciting. Obviously, it, that they were challenged by keeping time to only a few minutes. Uh, and we look forward to learning from their contributions in the future. And thanks to all the participants. So um, we're going to sign off now. And I'll hope to see everyone again in the near future. Okay. Bye for now.